reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Dr. Hayek, you were trained as a lawyer, I understand. Where were you trained? In Vienna. Now, I, my earlier background is biological, but during the World War I, I got intensely interested in political subjects. And that time, you could study economics in Vienna only as part of the law degree. So I did a regular law degree, although only the first part in the normal way. I have a very good education in the history of law. But then I discovered that I could claim veterans' privileges. And so I did the second part in modern law in a rush and uh, forgotten most of modern Austrian law. I was later again interested, in fact, uh, in 1939, or rather 1940, I was just negotiating with the Inner Temple people to read for a barrister there when I had to move to Cambridge, so the thing was abandoned. But I got so fascinated with the difference in the two legal systems, and my interest had turned to these problems, that I thought it might be useful to have systematic training, but it never came off, so my knowledge of common law is still very limited. Were you thinking of uh, practicing, actually? Oh, no, oh, no. You just wanted to study it? No, it was an just... Uh, <coughs> I became so interested in the evolution of the law and the similarity between the evolution of the common law and the later evolution of common law that I wanted just to know a little more about oh, judge-made law. Well, you, you went to the law school because you wanted to study economics. Yes, and your life work, of course, as everybody knows, has been in economics. Uh, when did you first begin to think about the relationship between legal philosophy and, uh, and the problem of maintaining a free society? Well, it's difficult to remember. See, I began to think about this problem in the late 30s in a general way. And uh, I think it began with the general problem of the genesis of institutions as not designed but uh, evolving. And then I found, of course, the law was paradigmatic for this idea. So it must have been about the same time when I wrote the, what is the counter-revolution of science thing, well, I was interested in the evolution of institutions that my old interest in law was revived as a, as I said, as paradigmatic for grown institutions distinct from designed institutions. Oh, I see. And this, this, uh, your interest in grown institutions uh, or evolving institutions came out of your work in biology? I understand you had some background? I was, a, well, I came, come from a completely biological family, so my knowledge of biology derives from my boyhood. The grandson of a zoologist, the son of a botanist. And the funny thing is that although my own family grew up separated from my Austrian family in England, they both have become biologists again. <laughs> it's a genetic trait. My brother was an anatomist, incidentally. So the tradition is wholly biological. But I've never studied biology. But I think by the time I became a student of law, I knew more biology than any other subject. But your, uh, your approach to these matters has been largely uh, affected by the, the fact that you were familiar with Darwin and uh, the evolutionary hypothesis of uh, uh, early Yes, age. I think it was mainly revived when uh, I returned to my psychological interests. I did not mention that while I was studying law, I really divided my time fairly equally between economics and psychology. Uh, it is the law on the side. And uh, I did conceive at that time, when I was 21, 22, ideas on physiological psychology, which I had to give up. I had to choose between the two interests, economics and psychology, and for practical reasons I chose economics.
But after I had published the Rutus Serftum in 1944, I wanted to take leave from this sort of subject. I so discredited myself with my professional colleagues by writing that book that I thought I would do something quite different and return to my psychological ideas. And between 45 and uh, 50, wrote this book, The Sensory Order, and that is based entirely on psychological ideas, on biological ideas, and that was, I think, my re the revival in uh, my interest in the theory of biological evolution. You mentioned that, the <coughs> pardon me, you mentioned that your uh, interest was divided between economics and psychology, and for practical reasons you took up economics. Yes. What were the practical reasons? There's no chance of a job in psychology. I see. That's a, that's a, uh, you mean the universities just didn't have an opening? No, in fact, there were hardly any psychologists teaching there. Certainly nobody had any sympathy with the kind of my interests. And uh, anyhow, at that time, you couldn't make an academic career your career. I mean, nearly everybody in Austria, except in the experimental subjects, who was aiming at a professorship, had to have a second occupation during the period in which he prepared for it. And there were then, in the early 20s, still no chance for psychologists getting an outside job, while as a lawyer with an interest in economics, it was quite easy. And what was your outside job? Well, at first I became a <coughs> civil servant in one of these temporary governmental offices for carrying out the provisions of the Peace Treaty of 1918, clearing the pre-war debts. And in that capacity, it so happens that my official chief was Ludwig von Mises, whom I had not known at the university, not known, and never attended his lectures at the university. And I rather like telling the story, came to him with a letter of introduction by von Wiese, who was my real teacher, who described me as a promising economist. Me is looking me. Promising economist? I've never seen you at my lectures. <laughs> <coughs> but we became, became very great friends afterwards, and for the next ten years I was working in Austria. It was for the first five my official head in that government office, and then he helped me to create the Institute of Economic Research, became vice president while I was director. So for the whole 10 years period, while I was still in Austria, I was very closely connected with them. I see. Is it possible for you to identify now uh, the major intellectual influences uh, on the development of your thought? I mean, I gather some of them uh, come out of a Darwinian brand of thought, and there must have been others in law and in economics. Well, I think the main influence was the influence of Karl Menger's original book, a book which founded the Austrian school, which convinced me that there were real intellectual problems in economics, and I never got away from this. I was taught by his immediate pupil, von Wiese, and that is my original background. I was later very much influenced by Mises. The first theoretical problems I took up were problems arising out of his theory of money and trade cycle, which I elaborated. So until the middle 30s, or late 30s, in my own age, I was a pure economist concerned with money, bank, capital, industrial fluctuations. And then came one event in my life which really changed my outlook. I became suddenly, it was a very f funny circumstance which started it. One of my colleagues at the London School of Economics used to make fun of the use of data by economists who were so much anxious to assure themselves that they were data that they were speaking about given data. And this talk about data made me aware that they are, of course, purely fictitious, that we are assuming these facts are given, but never say to whom they are given, which made it clear to me that the whole economic problem is a problem of utilizing widely dispersed knowledge which nobody possessed as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that determined my outlook on economics proved extremely fertile. In my whole interpretation of the market, prices as signals telling people what they ought to do, all sprang from this one thing which I 
first outlined in the lecture to the London Economic Club in 1937. And I think, while up to this point, my work was conventional in a sense, just carrying on with mm -hmm. what existed. That was a new outlook I brought into economics, which now I would like to put into the form of interpreting prices as signal leading us on the one hand to serve needs of which we have no direct knowledge, on the other hand to utilize means of which we have no direct knowledge, but it's all through the price signals which enables us to fit ourselves in an order which we do not as a whole comprehend. Well, that idea of uh, that information and facts are spread widely throughout the society and that no one person has even an appreciable fraction of those facts, also forms a large part of your basis of your philosophy of law. Oh yes, oh yes. And I, I want to come back to that in a moment, but, but before I did, I thought I'd ask you specifically, in your work on law, uh, if you can identify the writers or the persons who, who influenced you. Well, I don't think there was an original influence when I began to search for people sympathetic to me. It was very largely the late 19th century English lawyers, people like Dicey and Vinogradov and uh, Maitland, in whom I found uh, a treatment which was sympathetic to me and which I could use. But the initial interest came really from economics which led me back to law. And then I was trying to comprehend the basic of the English system and found in these English lawyers, Bryce is another one of that class. In fact, I found that the basic philosophy of liberalism was probably more clearly expressed by some of the English lawyers of that period than by any of the economists. Hmm. The, uh, the uh, positivists, the legal positivists, come in for uh, what one might with understatement, call considerable criticism in your latest book. Oh, yeah. And I wondered, uh, when did you first come across the legal positives? Well, Kaysen was my teacher. Oh, was he? Yes. <laughs> you went to his lectures. Yeah. <laughs> and did you, when, when you went to his lectures, did you then... I was greatly impressed by him at first. The logic of it has a certain beauty. And he was a very effective expositor. But uh, I think what disturbed me first was his claim to be the only one who is not ideologically affected. He pretended that he was a critique of all ideology and he was pure science. And I saw too clearly that he was as much affected by a certain kind of <laughs> ideology as anybody else. Well, when did you first uh, come to have the now critical view of Kelsen that you hold? Oh, certainly only when I was working on these problems ten years after my study in England. Uh, it was probably when I was working these things on the history of ideas, particularly on Kant and the saint Simonians, when I learned to see what I now call the constructivistic approach. And... Uh, it was in Kant and the early sociology that I found it most clearly expressed that I began to trace the development from Cartesian rationalism to positivism. And well, it was a very slow and gradual process which made to see it clearly. That's why I can't say exactly when it began. Mm -hmm. But by the time I did this book on the counter-revolution of science, I had a fairly clear conception of it. Well, in your latest book, um, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, uh, you're starting from a premise, I take it, that liberty is really declining throughout Western democracies, mm -hmm. and in fact is in considerable danger of extinction within the foreseeable mm -hmm. future. And I wondered if you'd care to talk a little bit about the evidence you see for the proposition that liberty is in fact declining and is in danger. Well, of course, the original uh, occasion was my analysis of the causes of the intellectual appeal of the Nazi theories, which were very clearly, I mean, take a man like uh, Karl Schmidt, one of the most intelligent of the German lawyers, who uh, 
saw all the problems, then always came down to what, to me, both intellectually and morally, is the wrong side. But uh, he did really see these problems almost more cl clearly than anybody else at the time, that uh, an omnipotent democracy, just because it is omnipotent, must buy its support by granting privileges to all number of different groups. And uh, that this is the main, that even, in a sense, the rise of Hitler was due to an appeal to the great numbers. So that you can have a situation where the support, the searching for support from a majority may lead you to the ultimate destruction of a democracy. Perhaps I should explain this, you see, the reason why I ever wrote the road to serfdom. In the late 30s, even before war broke out, the general opinion in England was that the Nazis were a re reaction, a capitalist reaction mm -hmm. against socialism. And this view was particularly strongly held by the then director of the London School of Economics, Lord Beveridge, Sir William Beveridge, as he was then. And I was so irritated by this, I'd seen the thing develop, that I started writing a memorandum for him, trying to explain that uh, this was just a peculiar form of socialism, a sort of middle-class socialism, not a proletarian socialism. And that led first into turning it into an article <coughs> and turning it into that book, for which I was able to use material I had uh, already accumulated for what I had planned to call a book about the abuse and decline of reason, of which the counter-revolution of science thing was to be the first introductory part. I thought I would trace the development of this extreme rationalism, as I now call it constructivism, from Descartes through Kant and positivism, and then in the second volume, called the decline of reason, showing the effects you know, leading to totalitarianism and so on. I had all this ready when I had the practical purpose of explaining to the English intellectuals <laughs> that they were completely mistaken in their interpretation of what the Nazi system meant, that it was just another form of socialism. And so I wrote up an advanced sketch of what was then meant to be volume two of the large work on the abuse and decline of reason, and uh, which I never completed in that form, very largely because the next historical chapter would have had to deal with uh, Hegel and Marx, and I couldn't stand in <laughs> once more diving into that dreadful start. <laughs> so I gave it up, and it's only now, almost 40 years after I started on the thing, that in uh, Law, legislation, and liberty have finally written out the basic ideas as they've gradually shaped themselves. Well, I wonder if you see, for example, in the United States, uh, evidence of the decline of freedom. Well, I think, in a way, the necessity for an American government in order to capture the support of all kinds of splinter groups, uh, granting them all kinds of special privileges is more visible than in almost any other country. It hasn't gone as far yet. I mean, uh, of course, your development is not a steady one, unlike the British one, which has been continuously in the same direction. Mm -hmm. You make experiments like the New Deal and then undo it again. But well, we never really undid a lot of the New Deal, I'm afraid. Did we? No, it's quite true, but uh, at the time I formed these ideas, of course it was during the New Deal, and uh, the New Deal was very largely the evidence for me that America was going the same way in which Europe, at least England, had gone ahead. Well, and I think it must be, I suppose. I suppose a lot of people would say that, in fact, in some sense, freedom was increasing in America because we certainly now uh, have much more freedom for racial minorities. Yes. We certainly, there is much more freedom in the area of sexual permissiveness. Mm 
there is much more freedom, if you want to call these things freedom, in the area of, of things that may be said or written or shown in, in, the, in the film, shown on the stage. Yes. Now those could be evidences, uh, I suppose the latter could be evidences of depravity rather than freedom. Yes. But I take it you think the... Uh, well, I think America is in a very early stage of the process. See, it comes with, uh, with the restriction of economic freedom, which only then has effects on the mental or intellectual freedom. Or, oh, in a way, the American development is probably a generation behind the one which gave me the illustrations, the German development. Mm -hmm. The American degree of restrictions of freedom is perhaps comparable to what was in Germany in the 1880s or 1890s under Bismarck, when he began to interfere with economic affairs. And that only ultimately under Hitler, gave the government the power, which the American government very nearly has, it doesn't use it yet, to interfere with intellectual freedom. Perhaps, in fact, perhaps the danger to intellectual freedom in the United States comes not from government so much as from the trade unions. Hmm. Well, I think what you're saying then is that although in some ways society is becoming more permissive, hmm. that the basic freedom upon which all others ultimately depends is economic freedom. Yes. And you know, even the permissiveness, I have my certain doubts whether this sort of permissiveness in which the, I'm not now speaking about the governmental activities, the change in morals due to permissiveness is in a sense anti-liberal because we owe our freedom to certain restraints on freedom. And uh, the belief that you can make yourself your own morals, and that's what it comes to, uh, is probably destroying some of the foundations of a free society, because a free society rests on people voluntarily accepting certain restraints. And these restraints are very largely being destroyed. I blame in that respect the psychologists uh, the psychoanalysts as much as anybody else. They are really the source of this conception of a permissive education, of a contempt for traditional rules. And it is traditional rules which secure our freedom. Yeah, I think somebody said that uh, the reason John Stuart Mill and others could talk yeah. about the requirements of uh, mm. al almost absolute freedom in some areas was that they were really relying upon an understood set of morals mm -hmm. which people would not transgress. Uh, so, and once that moral capital of that era has been dissipated, that kind of permissiveness or freedom is no longer really well, tolerable. So John Stuart Mill's attitude to this was very ambiguous. In a sense, his argument is directed against the tyranny of the prevailing morals. And uh, he is very largely responsible for the shift from uh, protest against government interference to what he calls the tyranny of opinion. And he encouraged a disregard for certain moral traditions. The permissiveness almost begins with John Stuart Mill's own liberty. So that there is a direct line between John Stuart Mill and Times Square in New York City, uh, which is a rather yes, yes, I, I think overly permissive uh, area. He, he is the beginning. You know, I sometimes said, I don't want really to exaggerate, but the decline of liberalism begins with John Stuart Mill's own liberty. That's an interesting thought. Do you agree with the uh, suggestion that uh, uh, Mill was really a much more sensible writer when he was not under the influence of Harriet Taylor? Yes, but I think that influence can be overrated. He always needed a moral soup. He was not a very strong character, fundamentally. And he was always relying on the influence of somebody else who supported him. First his father, then Comte, then Harriet Taylor. Harriet Taylor let him 
more deeply into socialism for a time than he stayed. But, uh, well, uh, I will tell you, I'm, the next article I'm going to write is to be called Middle's Muddle and the Muddle of the Middle. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great title. <laughs> uh, but returning to your book and the relationship between law and liberty, uh, you, you, as you just mentioned, I think, uh, Really central to your argument is the distinction between constructivist, constructivist rationalism and evolutionary rationalism. Yes. And uh, I wonder if you would elaborate for us on that distinction. Well, uh, I have tried to do that at length in that postscript to law, legislation and liberty, which I first gave us a Hophouse lecture on the title of Three Sources of Human Values, which essentially amounts to that our rules of conduct are neither innate, the majority of our rules of conduct, nor intellectually designed, but as a result of cultural evolution, which operates very similar to Darwinianism, uh, evolution, but of course it's much faster because it allows inheritance of inherited characteristics as it were, and that the whole of our system of rules of conduct, legal as well as moral, evolved, evolved without our understanding their function. I put it even as strong that uh, its culture which has made us intelligent, not intelligence, which has made culture. Uh, and that we are living all the time thanks to a system of rules of conduct which we have not invented, which we have not designed, and which we largely do not understand. Which we are now forced to learn to understand in order to defend it against the attempt to impose upon it, it a rationally designed system of rules, which we can't do because we don't even understand how our present system works, and still less how any designed rules would work. But in this context that I'm now trying to develop and to finally state my upshot of all my ideas. But I, I take it, and correct me, I may be quite wrong, uh, that you think that a body of rules or laws which evolves because it serves the group in ways the group doesn't even understand mm -hmm. is likely to uh, leave more room for freedom of the individual than mm -hmm. is a rationally designed body yeah. of law. Uh, yes, very definitely, but of course it takes a long story, uh, time really to explain this. A system of rules which has developed is a purely abstract system of rules which uh, merely secures coordination without enforcing upon us common goals or common aims. We are only happy emotionally if we are aware that we are working with our environment for common purposes. But we act actually living in a system where we profit from a method of coordination which is not depending on common purposes of which we are aware, but this rests entirely on our obeying abstract rules which are end independent as it were. And that is partly the cause of our discomfort in this system because it does not satisfy our emotional desire for knowing that we're working for common purposes. On the other hand, it has created these conditions in which we constantly ourselves serve purposes of which we have no information, serve needs of other people of whom we don't know, and profit from the doing of other people who don't intend to benefit us, but who, just by obeying these abstract rules, <coughs> produce an order from which we can uh, profit. That so there is a system which uh, creates a maximum opportunity for people to achieve their own purposes without their being constrained to serve 
common purposes with the group into which they were born. Of course, they are still free to join voluntarily sure. any group for pursuing common purposes. But this freeing from the need to pursue the same common purposes with the environment in which you are born is on one hand the basis of the worldwide economic order, on the other hand the thing which disagrees with our emotions. Well, I wondered, uh, it has in fact occurred that it, particularly in countries with the Anglo-Saxon legal tradition, that the evolved order has mm. allowed a great deal of freedom. On the other hand, other orders have evolved elsewhere in the world which were quite unfree. So there's no necessary connection between an evolutionary body of law, is there, and, and freedom? In a sense, yes. But it works both ways. Real evolution you have only under freedom. Wherever you have a community completely commanded by an authoritarian system, there is no evolution in the sense because better systems cannot prevail so long as the old system is uh, maintained by force. So it's rather that evolution is made possible by freedom and what you get in unfree systems is due to the fact that the emergence of the better has been prevented. You mean there's no competition between rules within the system when it's... No competition, uh, or no competition at least between groups pursuing different rules. You can't start in a little circle acting on different rules from these which are the official ones. Well, I, I, I'm not sure that you would say that uh, a, f a system which is allowed to evolve freely will necessarily prevail over a system which operates on command and tyranny. That is, to the degree that the issue between the United States and the Soviet Union is still in doubt, yes, uh, yes. a free system of law may not have that may not be conducive to, to the uh, will and the military determination necessarily. Oh, no, you had, of course, a historical instance when the military organizations of feudal state destroyed what was essentially already a commercial organization which in the antiquity had already existed. It was largely the invading military bands which came from the east which destroyed what was a sort of commercial civilization in a wider sense and which throughout the whole Middle Ages imposed the uh, authoritarian order and which was only gradually destroyed by some little commercial centers which escaped the feudal system, the Italian commercial cities and later the Dutch commercial cities, developing because they had uh, they allowed new rules to spring up and prevail. These little communities who acted on different principles really developed modern civilization. So that the, um, the survival of the fittest is really a survival of the fittest rules within a society where they're allowed to Which comes to the same thing as the fittest groups. Rules are always things practiced by some little group. I mean, take the trading towns of Mediterranean and uh, Phoenician and Greek times. It was certainly a breaking of the tribal rules when uh, these little centers began to trade with distant uh, places, taking from their neighbors what they could have used very well to sell it elsewhere against traditional morals and was this breaking of traditional morals which made the rise of commerce possible, which ultimately benefited all the people in these towns, all the undoubtedly greatly resented it, and things they could have well used were taken elsewhere. Yeah, but I, 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 if I understand you correctly, the, uh, the superior system of law within a society which allows law to evolve is not necessarily correlated to the military strength of that society or the military no, no, determination no, 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 of that no. society. So I see, uh, I think the most beautiful phrase which confirms this occurs in a recent study by youngish French economic historians that capitalism grows everywhere due to political anarchy. I think that's true. Is that right? No. I thought perhaps it created it. Oh no, oh no, I think it was a weakness of government which prevented government from suppressing these new developments which they otherwise would have done. Mm. Uh, you, you mentioned, you make a distinction 
between mankind evolving originally in small tribal mm -hmm. groups, which were end-oriented, mm -hmm. and now having uh, moved into the greater society, mm -hmm. which is not end-oriented, uh, but is more abstract and more yeah. general. And I wonder if uh, part of your argument is that that part of our evolutionary heritage in the tribal society mm -hmm. makes us long for an end-oriented society Yes, and yes. makes us long for kind of a tribal cohesion which will destroy the open society and its freedom. Uh, let me, forgive me if I first correct the thing. Tribal is not the right expression because the tribe is all the beginning of a political order. It's a small band of 40 and 50 in which mankind has lived for a million years before even the first tribes have arisen in which we've acquired our innate instincts. So our innate instincts are really based on a face-to-face -face society where you knew every other member and had to serve the new pope and every outsider was an enemy. That's where our instincts come from. Mm -hmm. The tribe was the first attempt of a sort of larger order where some rules as distinct from common purpose already began. That's why I don't like the expression tribal well, I mean, element in this sense. It's really, it's, we have no word for this uh, morals which existed in the small face-to-face -face band. But they determined our biologically inherited instincts, which are still very strong in us. And I think all civilization has uh, grown up by these natural instincts being restrained. And uh, I use even the phrase that man was civilized very much against his wishes. He hated it. An individual profited from it, but the general abandoning of these natural instincts and adapting himself to obeying formal rules which he did not understand was an extremely painful process, and man still doesn't like them. Well, I wonder if you thought that the, uh, the growth of intrusive government, which announces moral aims and regulates in the name of moral aims, uh, is in fact due to that evolutionary heritage, an attempt to get back to that kind of a society. Partly that, and partly at least, uh, to stop further development at the moment, people have always accepted a certain number of rules and to resent new ones. And the whole process is a process of introducing new rules st uh, adopted by a small minority which a majority rejects. And the function of government very frequently as a rule was to prevent further evolution. Yeah. Well, uh it would seem to follow from your, your view of uh, good law and a just law and a, a free society that legislation ought to be held to a minimum. Uh, d that is, deliberately planned law ought to be used only when it is quite clear yes. that something has gone wrong with the evolving law. Yes, yes. But even more important, that legislation in a strict sense ought to be confined to general rules, while what we now call legislation are um, largely orders, commands issued to particular groups, granting privileges to some and uh, imposing special duties on others, which is incompatible with the general idea that the order should be, the general order should be based on abstract rules only. We call now law a great many things which are not law in my sense. Well, yes, the, uh, if I understand it, as, as an evolutionary body of law grows up based upon the unarticulated assumptions of the group and what makes it work well, mm -hmm. and those assumptions then have to be articulated as disputes mm -hmm. arise and courts decide them. And that articulation is necessarily abstract and general. Mm -hmm. And in order to preserve the benefits of a system like that, you would like the legislator mm -hmm. to follow the model of legislating abstract exactly. general exactly, rules. Exactly, yes. That's what I mean. Rather than, and as I recall, you're, uh, you think a large part of our present difficulty arises from the fact that we have placed in one legislature uh, two quite different kinds of duties. One is that of announcing just rules of conduct uh. which are abstract and general and whose consequences are in many cases unforeseeable and also the function of running the government and making rules of organization. 
Yeah. It's perfectly correct. It's exactly what I'm trying to expound in the last volume of Law, Legislation and Liberty, which I have yesterday completed reading the proofs. <laughs> well, I, I want to understand the relationship between that, because is it your thought that uh, because we have a legislature which makes rules of organization for the government, huh? that, that the frame of mind, the command frame of mind that that inculcates infects its general lawmaking function? So that it does that, it legislates generally in that fashion when it shouldn't? Gen uh, well, the legislation no longer knows what laws are and constantly mixes up general rules and uh, orders for specific purposes. Then, in fact, most of our legislatures don't understand any law. All right, I, I won't disagree with that. With I that. won't disagree <laughs> with that. Uh, but uh, democracy, you say, uh, results rather naturally in groups demanding privileges mm. and in legislatures becoming end-oriented and passing specific mm. rules to advance yeah. specific yeah. groups. Uh, and there is a whole theory of democracy that that's interest group struggle is what it's about. Why do you think that necessarily leads away from freedom? Because all this legislation is a discriminating legislation which deprives some people of rights which others have. Mm -hmm. Every license given to anybody means that somebody else is not allowed to do it. And ultimately it leads to a sort of cooperative state. You mean the, uh, the sheer proliferation of regulations yes. leads right. to the point where everything is regulated? Mm. Uh, because if any one group gets privileges, others will demand them, and, f and finally mm. the entire society be permeated right. by rules. Yes. And it's that, uh, it is that feature that leads to the lack of freedom. Uh, you have a, uh, you refer in the first two books to the need for institutional invention mm -hmm. to uh, bring law back to its proper function. And I wonder if you would describe to us the, uh, just the nature of the institutional innovation you have in mind. What I have in mind very is very largely the law of corporations where we have very blindly applied the rules of law which have been developed to guide the individual to legal persons. Now, I have no doubt that the problem of delimitation of a protected sphere, which we have learned for the individual, cannot, in the same unchanged form to very big organizations, they have physical powers, which the individual does not have, and in consequence, we probably shall gradually have to invent new restrictions on what an organized group can do, which are distinct from the restrictions for the individual. I would no longer like to call it uh, invention, because I'm now sure you can't at once design such a system, but I think that's the direction in which we ought to aim to guide evolution, the problems which we ought to face much more consciously and to experiment in this direction. It's not a problem we can solve overnight. No, I was thinking of uh, your suggestion, which I have heard about, that we have two houses of a legislature. Oh, yes. uh, oh, oh, sure. and that, I was, I was going to ask you about that. Oh, I see, yes. Oh, I very much uh, am convinced that if democracy is not to destroy itself, you must find a method of limiting its power without setting above the representative of people some higher power. And that, I think, can only be done by distinguishing between two different representative assemblies, one confined to legislation in the classical sense of laying down general rules of conduct, and the other, directing government under the rules laid down by the first. That we get a limitation which results in certain things not being, nobody having <coughs> the power to do certain things at all. If the one assembly has only the power laying general rules, and the other can only within these general rules 
organize the means entrusted to government for its own purpose, there would be no authority who can lay down discriminating rules of any kind. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because uh, the idea is new to me, and it, it, uh, it's interesting, uh, provocative. But, for example, if we had a legislature laying down general rules, uh, would, for example, uh, our current labor legislation qualify as general rules? Legislation uh, authorizing the organization of unions, collective bargaining, strikes, and so forth. I think you have very sharply to distinguish. I think they would, the law should prevent all use of coercion, which would include the prevention of picketing, the prevention of uh, uh, union uh, firms, exclusive rights for a union to uh, allow employment in the thing. It would really come to the exclusion of what I call the privileges granted to unions at present mm -hmm. the authorization of the use of force, which only the unions have, which, of course, in the case of England, uh, is particularly flagrant because there it was introduced by a single law in 1906 when the unions were exempt from the ordinary law. But the same thing has resulted largely by jurisdiction in this country and to some extent on the continent. Uh, such legislation, I think, would be impossible if you had on the one hand only general rules equally applicable to all, and on the other hand, uh, governmental powers which did not extend to granting to anyone special privileges. There will still be a problem of services being, government services being unequal, but that I think would be a very minor problem. Welfare programs. Hmm? Welfare programs. Certain welfare programs, yes. I mean, the whole question of welfare states is an exceedingly difficult thing to discuss briefly because it's such a mixture of completely different things. I mean, there are certain services which certainly government can render without discrimination. There are others which uh, it could render, but only by very different methods, which it is now employing. But I'm sure there's one group which could not be achieved in such a system that is deliberate redistribution of incomes. What you could do is to provide a uniform floor for people who cannot earn a certain minimum in the market for whom you can provide in this form. But anything beyond this, any deliberate attempt to correct the distribution according to supposed principles of social justice are ultimately irreconcilable with a free society. Yes, you make the, I, I think that must mean, uh, related to your point in your book, that any attempt for the society to produce real equality mm -hmm. is ultimately uh, inconsistent with the quality, rationale yes, yes. of the free society. Yes. And that is because uh, equality does not occur, I, I'm guessing, that is because equality does not occur naturally and therefore requires pervasive regulation to be produced? Mm. Well, uh, let me put it the same thing by saying it, but in a slightly different form. You can allow people to choose their occupations only if the price offered to them represents their usefulness to the other people. Now, usefulness to your fellows is not distributed according to any principles of justice. Now, if you, you rely on prices and incomes to direct people what they ought to do, it must necessarily be very unequal. Mm -hmm. But any free society has many elements of coercion in it. And to have a progressive income tax for the purpose of redistribution of wealth uh, is inconsistent with the principle of a free society only in that it is a principle which, if extended, well, would result in uh, The point is, it's no principle. If you could have progressive income tax according to some general rule, which was really a general rule, it would be all right. But the essence is that progression is no rule. 
And things become purely arbitrary. Mm. I mean, uh, let me say incidentally, I'm not objecting to progression to the extent that is needed to make the whole tax burden equal, a compensation, <laughs> the progression of the income tax compensating for the regressive effect of indirect taxes. But I think the aim of taxation, if it is to based on general rules, should be the net, make the net burden of taxation proportional and not progressive. Because as once you have progressive, thing becomes purely arbitrary. It becomes ultimately an aiming at uh, burdening particular people on these legs. I wonder, uh, you have identified the uh, constructivist, rationalist fallacy, i.e. that a single mind can know enough to direct a society rationally. Is there a connection between that and what appears to be a growing egalitarianism in the society? I mean, the, the, the modern passion is for increasing equality. Yes, yes. I'm sure there is, although, so far as I can see, well, in fact, that agrees with what uh, you just suggested, egalitarianism is very definitely not a feeling, but an intellectual construction. I don't think people at large really believe in egalitarianism. Egalitarianism seems to be entirely a product of the intellectuals. Well, that's what I wondered, because I, I uh, uh, if you agreed with the argument of Schumpeter carried on by Crystal and others, yes. that in fact a large part of our social movement is due to the class struggle between intellectuals and the business classes. Yes, yes. And that intellectuals tend to be constructive, constructivist rationalists. Very much so, very much so. I don't think I'm as skeptical about the possibilities as either Schumpeter or Crystal are. I believe, in fact, this is my present attempt uh, to make the intellectuals feel intellectually superior if they see through socialism. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be, you're, you're an apostle to the intellectuals and you're going to, uh, <laughs> well, that's quite a task. But uh, I guess Schumpeter's point and Crystal's point is that it's a class struggle and the intellectuals, in order to achieve power, use the weapon of equality, which politicizes, which extends the powers of government. Yes, but they are not quite as sinister as they make them appear. I think the intellectuals really believe that egalitarianism is a good thing. They do not understand the function of inequalities in guiding our system. I think you can persuade them that uh, for the people at large, egalitarianism would not have beneficial effects. They believe it would. Well, it's curious uh, if it's mere intellectual error rather than intellectual error caused by group interest that so many economists are egalitarians and economists who seem to understand the workings of a market system. I'm afraid they don't. <laughs> <All right. laughs> no, well, I, quite I seriously, uh, within economics, a whole branch has grown up which is closely connected, or perhaps not necessarily, with the mathematical approach. Which, for the reason I gave initially, because they assume the data are really given, overlooks the problem of utilization of knowledge. They start out from the assumption, which the need for the system, everything is known anyhow, and therefore they really do not understand how the market operates. Well, I mean, all these ideas of uh, using the equations of Pareto to direct a socialist system, things like which Lange and uh, that group suggested, are really based on the idea that there is no problem of utilizing dispersed knowledge. They imagine that because they have this fictitious data, which for their formula they assume to be given to them, this is a fact, it isn't.